by you to have uh, Professor Seth Christensen with us. He recently joined us from UVU and uh, will share some of his story and background with us. I also had the privilege of uh, being in his ward for seven months. After we came back from the mission, our home was still being built. We lived uh, with my wife's mother for seven months, and Seth Christensen was President Christensen. He was our elder scorn president, and uh, what a privilege to you know he and his wife. We're grateful for you. Um, you asked some really good questions, Seth, and uh, these students will probably pepper you with a few more. They've been excited to have this semester a UX specialist. We haven't had one, and UX has taken over the world. That is. Um, EPP, right? Yes, that's right. And AI. <laughs> talk a little bit about both of those. Okay, wonderful. Well, the time is yours. Unless any of you, do we have an announcement from IPSO? There's a big potato event in Idaho. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Can you Six, just right here. Bring your favorite side of potatoes, and we're going to have the BOU Irish dance team come, come perform for us. So That's amazing. Yeah, be sure to make it, and we'll have judges. The faculty will judge your potatoes, and it'll be great. Everybody, please bring tater tots. Okay. <laughs> and how, what's the connection with the Irish uh, dance club? Is that yours? or? Uh, Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie thinking, hey, we've got a party on Thursday. What should we do? And I said, call oh, the Irish dance club. I bet there is one, and I bet they'll do it for free. And so we looked them up. They had a Facebook group. We messaged them, and they said we'd love to do it. <laughs> Our maybe like word to like they do birthday call. parties. By <laughs> <laughs> way of information, if you're in your YSA wards or in so and things like that, there are a lot of clubs on campus, and they will usually perform for free for people to do events. So it's like a YSA ward activity or a apartment activity or something. Like that. Professor West, thank you. Um, bastion of all good ideas. Thank you. I'm sure, Seth. Thank you again. Right. All right. Well, welcome. Thanks for having me to, uh, today. Sorry to be running in right as class is beginning, so I kind of caught my breath there. And uh, yeah, we'll get going here. So. All right. And uh, Seth, just you, you probably were aware, we do have a number of attendees over Zoom as well. Yeah. Can we say hi to all of our Zoomers? Yes. Hello, hello, Zoomers. Thank you for joining. Um, I like to wander a little bit, so you may not see me on the, the Zoom feed for a little bit, but uh, I, I feel like, you know, it's always good to start with disclaimers and these type of things, right? Uh, you know, we usually like to put our limitations at the end of like research, but I'm just gonna throw them up here at the beginning of my presentation. Um, I'm not an instructional designer, as you guys all know, right? So I don't have the same exact background and knowledge that you have. So hopefully something I share today is, is helpful. However, a little bit like by proxy, maybe I've, I've learned some instructional design stuff uh, because my wife uh, did, all but her dissertation uh, here at BYU in the IP and T program um, as her second graduate degree. So long story short, uh, when we started dating, he was just about to take off to go do a PhD at University of Kentucky. And, uh, and anyway, she decided I was worth staying, I guess. I don't, I, I think she probably should have rethought that, but uh, so she stayed and, and gave up a, a um, full ride scholarship and funding over at the University of Kentucky and stayed here. And then she was maybe going to go do that later. But while she was here, she's like, well, Seth, while you finish up your school stuff, I'm going to do another, another grad program. So that's when she started the IP uh, program here. Um, so I learned a lot from her and she so has, which yeah. What's your wife's name? Kimberly Christensen. Kimberly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think so too. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, I've, I've learned actually a lot from her, uh, just talking with her methods from her uh, that I was able to incorporate into my, my own work initially as a, a designer. Uh, this might be more of a philosophy thing, but I don't really consider myself an expert in really anything. Um, but uh, I, I have an insatiable uh, curiosity and I, I love to learn. 
and um, hopefully, you know, sometime shortly before I die, I can be an expert in something. But uh, but hopefully, I can share some experiences, some thoughts, and some things today that that will that will help you help you on your your paths. Because really, I think there are some parallels, similarities uh, between user experience design and instructional design. In fact, I think. Uh, the degree in IPNT uh, is, is a great degree for those that may want to segue into user experience design. Um, disclaimer number three, this might seem like a little bit weird, uh, but I'm really not that in love with technology. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more and actually how I think that's a little bit of a superpower of mine uh, being a user experience designer. Uh, but I don't get too excited about like new technology. I, I think it's because I always see like the pitfalls of like how this is going to be terrible for users and humanity potentially. Not that it'll be good too, but I, I tend to see all like all the pitfalls that might be, be coming with it. Um, so with all those disclaimers, naturally I'm here today uh, to discuss many things UX related to a bunch of people who are uh, going to become instructional design designers and professors. Um, and hopefully we, get, we uh, have a good discussion and, and learn some things together. So these are some things we'll discuss. I just want to give like a very brief bio talk a little bit about what is user experience design, um, talk a little bit about my journey to, uh, to ex user experience design and some of the experiences I had and, and kind of what I am working on now and, and what I plan to work on going forward. So just a, a quick summary, I did graduate with my undergrad degree here at BYU. I did it in industrial design. Um, does everyone know what industrial design is? Yeah, it's no more, right? Yeah, it's you say what? It is no more. Oh, I, I, yeah. Well, uh, long story short, it, it, it's kind of been salvaged. Um, so, uh, starting in the fall, there's going to be a new degree. It's going to be called Product and User Experience Design, and it will be it'll have two specific tracks within it, and one is kind of more physical product oriented, i.e., what used to be. Uh, industrial design, then the other one will be more digital uh, product oriented. So kind of user experience design. Yeah, and so that starts in the fall. That's kind of exciting. It's also a lot of work. Um, lots of new courses that I'm working on uh, developing for that new program. Uh, so yeah, no longer, I guess, called industrial design, but it's still kind of, kind of, it's still going to still be around. Um, I worked for a couple of years uh, as an industrial designer and graphic designer. And eventually I'll show you kind of some initial stuff that I did there. Um, and then after those couple of years, I transitioned uh, into being a user experience designer. I'll talk about kind of what that looks like and why I did that. Uh, while I was working for software companies as a user experience designer, I pursued a graduate degree in design thinking. Um, at, and that was at the uh, Radford University. Um, they're located in Virginia. Um, taught for three years at UVU. Uh, then I left for about a year and was a director of product design for a software company. And then I was hired on a little over a year ago at BYU um, as a tenure track professor here. I said we don't use tenure track, CFS, uh, if that means anything to any of you. But, um, so initially, I kind of want to get a sense of like, what are your lifting understanding and thoughts on like, what is user experience design? So think about it for a second. And I just kind of kind of want to see what we what we already know. So I'm not rehashing stuff that you already know. Or perceptions, I don't even have to be correct. Like what anyone want to venture some thoughts? I'll yeah. Try. <laughs> I'm just, just designing a cross educational product or experience in a way that is easy to use and follow along, it's just a good experience for the, the, the learner or the people who are using the product. Okay, great. Designing it with that in mind, that's what I kind of think of. Yeah. Awesome, I think that's, that's great. Yeah, and it's designing it in a digital space. Like it's it's using digital technology almost entirely, my understanding. Yeah, so yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that. Like that's kind of what it's ended up being, right? Theoretically, I guess it could be anything, right? Uh, but it's generally been in the digital space. It's focusing on users so that you can design to solve problems that they have. Yeah, kind of focusing on that that end user is kind of kind of your goal and your your uh, your job to help make their experience better. Any other thoughts? Yeah, 
back here. Um, like, as far as UX design is concerned, would it have to do with like, hearing like, our user experience, like, how long someone's spending on like, if what they're clicking on is actually clickable, finding what they want to find. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of all falls under the umbrella of like usability testing, which is part of yeah user experience design. So uh, testing to see if there's any issues with with them navigating through through that product or experience, and um, and also just assessing right that that overall experience is, is part of being a user experience designer. Great. Any other any other thoughts? So I think you guys like have hit a lot of things. Okay. Um, so as part of my uh, thesis, I was looking at, I wanted to look at like how user experience design was being defined. Uh, particularly, I was curious because I was both studying it and also I had worked in it for several years. I was curious to see like the difference between like what the academic def definitions of user experience design was and uh, what the industry essentially definitions of user experience design what those definitions were. Whoa, what happened there? Well, uh, we're gonna jump back here. Uh, we're gonna jump ahead. Speaking of experience, user experience, uh, we start at the bottom. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, particularly looking at it uh, within the context of software organizations, because um, they're the ones who have really adopted this job title of user experience designer. Um, so some academic definitions, um, you know, are meets the exact needs of the customer without any inconvenience. These are all pulled from some, from some different academic articles. Utilize the simplicity and elegance to create products that are a joy to own and experience. Does not just give users what they want. Does not provide a checklist of features. It's not just a user interface, UI, or just usability. Requires the seamless merging of the services of multiple disciplines. So they're suggesting it's multidisciplinary. Um, another another kind of set of definitions is or criteria is effectiveness. How good is the result? Efficiency. How fast or cheap is it? Emotional satisfaction, how good does it feel? Relationship quality, what expectations does it create for subsequent interactions? Um, so some of these touch on uh, things that are both kind of business related and user related, like the efficiency part. Um, there. Ooh, yeah. I don't know why this keeps doing that. Okay, um, so practitioners, so like if you went and asked like five different user experience designers, like what user experience design was, you'd get five different answers. Um, and uh, here's just a couple of examples, and I'm just going to read the first one. Um, UX is about how something works. So I'm just pulling these from like blogs, from uh, UX forums, um, personal websites, those type of things about UX designers defining what UX is. UX is about some, how something works, not how it looks. User experience design is about finding the sweet spot where the human needs and goals of the business meet. Uh, the UX designer's job is to start with the psychology of the user. The designer is interviewing customers in the field, tracking a journey for them. She's doing UX. Um, that's like a lot, a lot to put on one person, but uh, that's, that's what they're saying a UX designer is. This one even puts a few more things on, like what a UX designer is. So I think that harkens back to the academic definition that it is multidisciplinary. Um, so uh, maybe someone doesn't have all these skills. And if you've ever gone and looked up anything about user experience design, like there's like this whole like I don't know movement of people who just want to really make sure to let you know that user experience is not just user interface. Um, it's kind of interesting because user interface for like a digital product is like a very important part of the user experience. I don't think you can totally separate them out. 
Um, but uh, on principle, I guess they're saying that it, it does go beyond just like a, a good looking UI, which I totally agree. Um, here's a diagram that's been around for a while. You may, some of you may have seen it here. It kind of talks about like, once again, that there's multiple, multiple disciplines that are usually involved in kind of this realm of user experience design. Um, so, you know, there's computer science, there's information architecture, there's communication design, interaction, what used to be called more like interaction. <laughs> all those factor in into uh, what a user experience designer is. On the right um, is a, a survey that Adobe did about five years ago. Um, and they just, they surveyed hiring managers. So essentially like UX managers um, to see like what they were looking for in, in their designers. And I know that's kind of, kind of small for some of you in the back, but um, I think this is evolving over time. But uh, one of the things that they wanted was just that they're actually familiar with the tools of, of UX and user interface. The second biggest one was collaboration. So a soft skill. Um, which is interesting. Um, analytical thinking, another soft skill, and then kind of uh, user interface kind of skills here with screen layout and composition. Um, ability to visualize solutions. Um, some, some, they're saying some programming skills, team building, interface design, project management, um, and uh, understanding of software and hardware development, so kind of understanding the, the medium that they're working in. Uh, so part of my thesis, uh, I was trying to look at like how how this is being defined multiple ways, and one of the one of the ways I looked at this and tried to define it based off like the industry perspective is I went and pulled um, about fifty, which I know is still not a huge sample size, but fifty job postings uh, who are were looking for UX designers, and this was in two thousand seventeen, so it's been a few years, and some things have been evolving and changing. So I, I pulled all these uh, job postings and then I went through and I, I coded them all. Uh, so looking for different aspects or different things that they're asking for a, a UX designer. Um, and after I, I coded them, I basically uh, mapped out like a, a frequency count of, of how often they're mentioning specific things, which frequency does not necessarily mean that that's always the most important thing that they're asking for, but it is an indicator that this is somewhat important because they keep on mentioning it even multiple, multiple times in the same, same job posting. Um, and these are kind of the results. Uh, I know there, there were some questions that came in off of my survey that was kind of like, what, what like hard and soft skills are, are people looking for in a UX designer? And it, it does vary a little bit based off of the title. Um, so I, I looked specifically at people that were called UX designers, uh, senior UX designers, product designer, uh, which is now, been, that, that title has been being used more and more for what looks to be kind of more UX design jobs. Um, and I looked also specifically at uh, UX researchers over here on the right. So um, just to, let's just take a look real quick at like the, the UX designer and what, what things were mentioned the most in these job postings. Uh, so prototyping was at the very top. And that's partly, you know, being able to visualize a solution, kind of see what that's going to be like. Um, and on average, it was mentioned almost five, you know, four and a half times uh, per job posting. Collaboration was the second most uh, mentioned attribute. Uh, knowledge of prototyping tools, uh, research for the UX designer, development um, was mentioned. However, I will say with the caveat that a lot of times when it mentions development, it's like familiar with HTML and JavaScript. So you can interpret that a lot of ways. Uh, most UX designers that I know don't do any development themselves, but they are at least a little bit familiar with the constraints of, of the medium or the, the interfaces that they're working with. Um, so those are the top five there. Um, top five for a UX researcher, uh, not surprising research was mentioned the most. But then it's communication is a, a second, complexity and synthesis, uh, and collaboration, and then documentation were the top five for someone that wanted to be a UX researcher. And over here on the right is just every, everything combined, um, what was mentioned most. And, and interestingly, when you combine the two, uh, 
research is mentioned the most, um, uh, which I find is interesting because in my experience, that's not always what they give the most priority to um, in, in the US, the US design process, um, but it was frequently mentioned in the job postings. So what kind of research do you think they're suggesting? Research what's going on in the environment, in the market, research in product that they're using? Right, uh, that's, that's, that's a good question. So they're, they're using this as a blanket for probably two or three primary things. One is uh, going and doing user research to understand who is using this product or who will be using this product um, and, and doing uh, various forms of that type of like upfront user research. And then probably the next biggest thing is uh, on the other end of kind of the design and development process or closer to the other end is more of the testing and validating of like the solutions that have been proposed. Um, so having them go through like um, task and scenario analysis, which is essentially, you know, let's say I was gonna test a competitor product to Canvas or Learning Suite. Um, a scenario and task analysis is basically, I give you a, what would be a realistic scenario to you, like, hey, uh, you to turn in an assignment for Dr. West class tonight. Uh, right. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and then we just plop you in the software and we say, hey, you need to turn in this assignment tonight. How would you go about doing that? It's a very like open-ended thing. And then we observe like, oh, how do they do it? And do they do it? Do they try to do it in the way that we expected? Um, so that's kind of, that's a, basically what a, a scenario and task analysis is, which is used uh, very, very often uh, in UX um, design and research. Um, but then there's also like other usability testing you can do um, on top of that, which is sometimes in, it's in conjunction with that uh, scenario and task analysis, which is like, how long did it take them to perform the task? Uh, what, uh, what was their overall uh, kind of emotion while performing that, that task? Were they frustrated? Were they, did it seem easy? Um, and even on top of that, I've started experimenting a little bit more with like layering another, you know, other data points on top of that while, while putting like eye tracking equipment on them and seeing what are they looking at uh, when they're performing this task. Um, so that's kind of yeah, some of the research that they're, they're, they're talking about. Eye tracking, I'll say not so much. They haven't been doing that too much in industry, uh, partly because previously it was kind of cost prohibitive. Um, but it is actually becoming very affordable for any any medium to large size company to, to start doing eye tracking on, on some of their products. Um, I had a really good question come through uh, on that survey that I sent out about like what's the difference between experience and service user experience design and service design. Um, has everyone heard of service service design or at least heard it mentioned before? So this is a good question. So there's uh, the, I guess what I'll start with the theoretical, like what's the difference between the two? So if you ask most service designers or professors of service design or looked up the literature on it, they would say that essentially service design is a broader uh, umbrella. Um, so basically you're looking at an experience across multiple, maybe touch points, multiple um, locations, things like that. So Maybe an example of this would be um, if you were like a, maybe an analogy would be like a service designer would maybe oversee the design of a, an entire curriculum, right? But a user UX designer might just be looking at design of a particular course. And so the service designer kind of oversees like, how does that course fit into the overall curriculum? And what are all the resources that we need to make this curriculum happen? Like how many professors do we need? How many adjuncts do we need? Um, you know, what materials do we need? What classrooms do we need? So they're looking at all the resources, the people, and the touch points to kind of oversee this, this larger experience is what a service designer does. So another like analogy or example would be um, someone maybe, a service designer might oversee the uh, shopping experience for, for Target or something like that. And they're looking at it from like a, a high level view of, Okay, when a person, how does a, what are all the ways that a person interacts with Target? Okay, it might be the website, it might be our, our app. They might come into the store and use one of our kiosks, might interact with the, a person in the store. Um, so they're looking at all those different touch points and 
and mapping them together and trying to create like a, a holistic good experience. Uh, whereas typically like a UX designer would be focused more on, okay, how, how do we just improve the website portion of this? Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the difference uh, as far as like theoretically. However, I will say like when you look at job postings, um, really there's, really there's like a, it's not so clear cut is that like, you'll see, um, you're like the service would be high level view over here. UX would be over here, but you'll see kind of jobs that are called UX director or manager or things like that that are essentially doing what that's uh, what a traditional like service designer would do, and and vice versa. Sometimes we even see like service design jobs that are a little bit more like you know focus on one particular product or or one particular feature or things like that. So they're a little bit more like what would be normally considered like a UX designer. So I wouldn't get caught, too, caught up too much in the, the terminology as far as like going out in the industry, but I'd look at like, hey, do I wanna to work towards being someone that's architecting an experience over multiple touch points? Um, or do I wanna be someone that can, can focus a little bit more on like a particular part of that, that touch point? Um, so yeah, once again, moral of the story of both like some of my some of my research about UX titles and the kind of the, the job descriptions and even the service design stuff is I don't get too caught up in titles. You need to look through the job postings themselves if you're interested in kind of going into this, this realm of things and kind of see how they describe things. Because just like how I said before, if you have to ask any UX designer what UX design is, you'll get like five different definitions from five different people. Um, still the same and the, and the names are evolving and changing. So there's kind of a trend now um, that's been happening even more so over the past five years where a lot of companies are like, oh, well, we're no longer UX designers or product designers, which, you know, terminology wise, that kind of makes sense to me. You're usually focused on a specific product that you're designing for an end user. Um, but then that had like industrial designers all up in arms because they're like, hey, we call ourselves product designers. And so now it's confusing, like a physical product designer versus a digital product designer. Um, anyway. That's just kind of the state of things. So if you're looking for jobs in this in this realm, you might also look for product designers, but then you have to make sure that's kind of filter based off of uh, software companies if that's what you're really looking for. One more question for you. Yeah. What about the role of UX in the development of a new product and then the role of UX in the maintenance of a existing product? Um, and is this, is this instructional designers that we involved mostly in the development, but sometimes in the, the, the maintenance and the, the updating. But, uh, obviously, there's a cost factor. And everybody probably, this is the one corner that we probably cut the most of the times is the evaluation. Yeah. But uh, when, I mean, we're working on education products one of our clients is now, and you know, we use <laughs> many stages and levels of you know, okay, we did this, we tweaked it, you know, the new version, how is that going to, how is that going to be received? And feedback, oh, we better tweak it again. I don't know. Mind speaking to that for a minute? Yeah. Um, you know, that's a really, that's a really good question. So um, a lot, I'll first say that a lot of my work has been with kind of primarily startup and mid-sized companies um, where there is a lot of there's, there's some structure, but they're also looking for a lot of change in their product. And that experience is totally different than working for a much larger established company that has things very defined. And I have had some experiences there too. So maybe I'll just kind of share some, some anecdotes. Um, so on, on kind of the startup, the startup end of things, uh, it kind of depends on like your preference and what you're interested in. But that's, for me, that's kind of like a fun place to be because you are able to kind of um, change a lot of like their, their, their design and structure. And you, you tend, and you tend to have like a lot more latitude and you're wearing a lot more hats um, in the company to be able to make that happen. Um, but I did work for a little bit as a consultant for Aetna, um, the health, you know, the healthcare company. And, uh, and kind of my experience there was, uh, 
if you want to go into kind of like more corporate big company, you, you need to have a lot of patience is what I, is what I learned. Um, and you need to have a view of like the long game. Um, because things like, like we're at a startup where I'd be like, hey, uh, let's just change you know, something simple, all right? Let's change all of our buttons to be this way, right? That's like something very small or let's change like our menus to be this way. Um, at a startup, it's like, oh yeah, we'll do that in like a month, right? Yeah, you know, as long as it's validated and stuff, let's, let's do that. At Aetna, it was, we'll get to that in about three months, you know, um, and, and look at a value and, and doing that. Um, or a year sometimes. Um, so it is like a lot, a lot slower paced is, is one of the, the differences. Um, but that being said, like sometimes when you work on with companies like Aetna or like Microsoft or things like that, uh, you do have like a larger reach as like a designer because there are more people using that product. So even though it takes a lot longer and sometimes it's painful to get all the approvals that you need to make some of the changes that you need to, um, it, it can, you know, that can in itself be rewarding to be able to affect the usage of so, so many uh, end users of the product. Um, I don't know. Does that? Yeah. Is, uh, I guess related to that are the different types of user styles. Um, in instructional design, we do a lot of personas. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, we have different users using our products. Um, you know, like UX designer may fit in this one category. Um, but maybe you have another designer or another user that, just for lack of maybe a better example, left brain, right brain, I mean, a lot of that stuff's been debunked. But we, we all know this. We, we use things differently. We learn things differently. Left-handers, right-handers. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so not, it's not a bad thing that it takes longer per se, right? And sometimes it's actually sometimes it can be a really good thing. Um, that it does take longer because, like you said, you get more, more perspectives on it, more views on it, um, and so so the, yeah, it's not always necessarily a, a bad thing if it if it is in a, a company where you yeah. have more people working on it and uh, takes a little bit more time. Um, yeah, I'm going to blow through some things really fast. So some things, you know, I just kind of highlight some things I learned on the way. So as I started like my career. Um, there's a lot of things that I, I didn't know. Uh, I think there's a lot of assumptions that I made um, coming in as like a, a naive, I guess, junior designer into companies. And uh, one of those assumptions was I thought I was going to have like a little more influence on the product besides just what it kind of looked like. So in my training as an industrial designer, we did focus a lot on like visuals. Um, so I, I started at companies. Um, while all these, these photos are a little bit grainy, but sorry about that. Um, started at companies primarily doing a lot of like visual design for 2D and 3D stuff, uh, which, you know, I kind of enjoyed, but uh, one thing that was bothersome for me was I really wanted to know like how this was any better than any other existing product out there in the market, right? And also the tree hugger in me, because I'm naturally like a big tree hugger, was like, I don't want to be designing stuff essentially fast fashion, right? Where people are going to buy this because it looks cool and then chuck it out. On Twitter. So like, this was kind of like eating on me as a, as a young junior designer. And so I was like, man, I don't want to create junk and I don't want to, um, I want to know if it's actually having any impact on people. So this is quite a variety of products. It's like now going into very industrial, uh, truly industrial stuff. This was for a uh, oil field technology company. But one of the projects, and there's multiple projects around this that also influenced it, but one of the main inflection points that I had kind of trying to redirect my career a bit was I was working for a spinal orthotics company. So uh, basically a company that does back braces and neck braces. And um, I was assigned to work on a product. I don't show up very well there, but we'll just skip that one. A, a product for people with kyphosis, which is the curvature of the upper back. Um, well, this is like cool. Like I was like, okay, this is like a meaningful product, right? It's gonna be for the healthcare industry. Um, and it's kind of like fascinating to me because like working with human bodies and like trying to create things that fit it is like a really challenging thing. So I kind of like really enjoyed that. Um, here's just some kind of like process shots of like stuff that I was making, I had to test things out. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
And ultimately we landed with like this, this brace here. Um, and uh, we kind of got to about this stage, like this is actually, this is actually my prototype. Like I hand sewed this, I can tell because there's a, their actual ones don't uh, have something there at the end. But anyway, um, so this is the prototype I created. And like I said, I was kind of naive, uh, new to, you know, new to this type of industry. And I, I just assumed, okay, cool. We got to this point. Now we're going to like have like, I don't know, two or three weeks of testing or something right, to, to see how this goes, or maybe even more than that, right? Because it's a healthcare product. Um, so I was like talking to the people. I'm like, hey, uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to like do some testing. Or like, do we have someone that does that? Is that me? Uh, I don't know. And like, oh no, like we tried it on a couple of people and, uh, and we're, we're, we're just, we're going to start creating the tech packages to send off to the manufacturers to have it created, which once it started to be created, it was like, it's game over. Like you're not going to make any changes because it usually costs too much to make changes to the physical product at that point. I'm like, no way. Like, we're not going to do testing on this. Like we got to do way more testing than that. And so I kind of like try to push back as much as I could as like a very junior designer. And they're like, yeah, no, like we, you know, we're, we're good. Like market validation's great. Like this is, I think we're, we're, we're good to go. So let me ask you this, like if you were in my scenario and they're like, yeah, we're not really going to invest any more time in this. Um, but you kind of like, well, I, I feel like we should test a little more. What would you do? You know, I'd be frustrated, but I would probably understand that I'm not going to get my way. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of, I kind of was on the same page there. I was like, I'm, I'm back a little bit, but like, I, I get I'm the peon here right now. Yeah. Make sure that my suggestion was well documented. Yeah, <laughs> that's 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 good. That's a good point. Yeah, make sure make sure it's, it's noted very in various forms. Um, yeah, yeah, really good. Any other thoughts? Like, what would you do? Let's say you, let's say you knew you had a week before they were going to send off what we call the tech packages to the manufacturers to start doing some initial prototypes. What do you try to do in that week? I mean, if you have any resources at all, you would look for somebody to test with and propose a viable, yeah, we could do this in two days. Look, I've got a guy, you know, and, and actually pitch that and then they'll say, great. And you go ahead and do it. I mean, that's all on you though. Yeah. Yeah. So it kind of just, uh, do a little like skunk work project on your own, try to find some people with kyphosis um, within a week, line it up, get it tested. Um, so it's a good idea, right? I thought I, try, I tried. I couldn't find people with kyphosis in that short of time that were willing to, to do it. But yeah. Try to find compromise. I mean, try to reach a, yeah. an agreement, right? Right, yeah. Try to find some sort of compromise, like, hey, couldn't we push this back another week or something like that? Um, right, yeah. So I tried a lot of these things that you're mentioning and I, I, was, I was failing miserably. And so the, my last resort was like, well, no one else is gonna wear this like a normal person would, I wanna wear it, at least until you can send it to the manufacturers, right, the tech drawings. Um, so I wore it um, like 24 hours a day for a week. Well, not 24 hours. I wore it all day, except for when I was sleeping and uh, for a week. Because I was, I, was, I was like, at least, you know, I can like try to walk the mile, you know, walk the mile with people that are going to have to try to wear this later, right? See what I can learn from it. So I did that and I did find some things that I felt like were kind of big issues with the brace. Um, so then I had this new battle, right? Where I was like, one of the biggest issues with it was, um, so it's kind of like, it kind of looks like a backpack in some ways, right? And down here at the base, there's like this actually really cool, mechanism down here that like really anchors this brace to your lumbar region down here. Um, super awesome. I wish I came up with it, but they had already figured that part out before I was working on the brace. Um, and so like, so that kind of anchors it. And then you have these straps that like go over your shoulder and it's supposed to pull your shoulders back a little bit. But the problem is like, if you know anything about physics, right, it's not just going to pull it back. It's also going to pull down on your shoulders a little bit as you're, as you're wearing that brace which isn't totally uncomfortable per se, like that's not necessarily the big problem. The problem was when you got up and down out of chairs multiple times a day, that downward force on your shoulders would then hike that brace up, even though it was fairly well anchored on your, your lumbar region of your back. Um, so that was probably the biggest issue is like, 
is that after getting up a couple of times, you'd always always have to readjust the brace, which was kind of kind of tedious as a, as a user. So I brought that up. I was thinking, yeah, maybe this will slow it down, right? It'll give us another couple of weeks to try to figure this out. And so then I fought that fight, which I won't go into right now. And I lost. And they're like, Seth, this is the message they gave me. Rev B, they said, which was their code for next version. We'll we'll try to address that. Um, 12 years later, they're selling the same dang brace, but uh, so we haven't gotten to that Rev B yet. Uh, so, so this was like a huge uh, inflection point for me in my career where I was like, I have got to one, figure out how to convince people to do more testing. And I've got to learn more about it myself because I wasn't really very well trained in research and testing um, in my undergraduate degree. Um, so long story short, uh, so I can save some time for questions. I started looking for jobs where uh, they at least uh, voiced that they were interested in doing kind of more usability testing and user research. And it just so happened that the tech industry was the one that kind of seemed most interested in that, especially with this rise of this kind of new position called a UX designer. Um, so I started, I kind of switched from physical product to digital product. Um, I had to like reteach myself some things because it's different designing a 3D product versus a 2D product. Um, and, and the way that I personally made the transition is I initially found uh, projects where they wanted both a physical product and a digital part of the product. Um, so that was kind of my way of doing that. I started doing consulting work like, oh, cool, you can do our, our 3D part of this product and our 2D uh, part of it. So this is like, this is one of the examples of that where I designed an app uh, but I also designed this little mechanism that goes into your ODP ports in your car uh, that measures uh, diagnostics of your car. It's the same port that mechanics will use to kind of try to troubleshoot some things that are going on in your car. So uh, at the time, this is a few years ago, they were creating their own consumer version of this, and they had their own um, kind of use case of what, what they wanted to do with this that I can't go into for now. But um, I designed some retail experience stuff, some kiosks and apps. And then I started getting more into uh, this realm of user experience design called uh, business to business software product, which is huge, by the way. Um, like there are so many jobs in this. And business to business software product, are basically things that aren't direct to consumer apps. So uh, once again, Canvas would be an example of this. Sure, Canvas has the end user of a student, but they're selling it to universities, which are essentially other businesses, right? And those universities are the ones that make that purchasing decision. You don't as students, you're just kind of forced to use it as the end user. Um, so there's like, a, there's a lot of products in this realm that need designers. And so that's where I started doing a lot of my work. Uh, this was for a company doing um, mobile device management. So, so retailers that maybe have like a thousand uh, iPads in their various stores. Like trying to maintain and update all of those is like kind of a pain unless you have a software to help you do that. Um, so this was a company that had the software that did that. Um, this was kind of my first foray into business to business software product. Uh, this was for another company doing event management software. They're actually up here at the point of the mountain. They're called Brain Focus. You may have seen or may see at some point their their uh, sign from the free Okay, yeah. Um, when did you work for him? Uh, right before COVID for six months. Okay. Implementation analyst. Yeah. So I was there till about, I was there 2016, 2018. Like I was there when they had like 30 people. And by the time you were there, I don't know, what was it? hundred? Yeah, about a hundred. Yeah. Um, so this company kind of like a lot of companies hired me initially, primarily for my visual design skills. Uh, but this was the first time after learning from my previous experiences that I learned how to actually like convince them that they needed to look at more than just kind of updating their UI. Um, and the, the way that I ended up doing that, and it sounds so simple, right? You guys are probably like, oh, yes, yeah, we all we, we would have thought of that already. But um, as I came to them with a very concrete documented plan of how I was going to do it, how much time it was going to take how much resources, which typically was not very much, it was going to take. And, and then they would look at it and they'd be like, oh yeah, sure, we'll give you time to, to do that. Whereas before what I'd do is I'd kind of initially pitch it just kind of in like a conversation with them. Like, hey, I'd like to do 
such and such kind of research projects um, with with your company, right? Um, and then they, in their mind, they'd be like, oh, research, that's going to take way too much time, cost way too much money. Uh, we, we don't want to do it. So, um, so I learned a very concrete plan um, that I, I put in front of them. And what I, one of the first things I did for them is they're like, hey, could you update our UI? Which is, this is updated. I wish I had an image of their previous UI. It was kind of interesting. Um, and, uh, but I said, hey, that's great. I think you guys do need to update your UI, but one of your biggest problems right now is your navigation. You have over you know, 150 pages or parts of the software that uh, people can navigate to. They haven't figured out how to architect it very well yet. Um, like, okay, that sounds interesting. So then I put together a plan of like, hey, this is how we can test and, and assess your navigation and figure out what's the best navigation um, for your company. And uh, the way that we ended up doing that is, has anyone heard of like open cart sort? people. Um, essentially, that's, that's what we did. Open court card source, closed card source, and we did tree testing. Um, and we used software to help, help do it so I could test remotely and also made it a lot easier to analyze. Sorry that some of these images are so blurry, but this is like a similarity matrix. It's basically showing, hey, when uh, people basically think these two things should be grouped together in a navigation, it's essentially what, what it's saying in different points. And this is how often out of all the people that tested it thought that those two should be together in a navigation. That's what made sense to them. Um, the endogram is a result of that. Um, let's see, what else do I wanna cover in the last couple of minutes for questions? Okay, a couple of things that I'll just hit on real quick uh, before questions. Oh wait, it ends at 1250, right? Yeah. So oh, sorry, I was thinking it ended. touch on this and, uh, and we've been able to ask around. So this is fascinating. Um, I'll say a couple things uh, as far as like what's next now that I'm a professor at BYU. Some things that I'm looking into is uh, there's a lot of industry conventions used in UI and UX, um, which have been adopted over time and uh, that I think could be rethought. So things as basic as like a toggle button. Um, I've started doing like a pilot study of toggle buttons. People still don't really without additional context, people don't understand whether a toggle button is indicating something's on or off, right? So I think there's a better way of doing that. I could go into all the reasons why it doesn't make sense to people. Um, another thing that I'm looking into is one of the companies I worked for previously uh, was doing machine learning and their product was a natural language understanding and processing software that communicated with people through text. And um, when I was there, uh, there, there are some ethical questions that kind of came up for, for me in this kind of realm of things. And one of them was they were communicating with people that did not know they're communicating with AI, right? It was, it was good enough that it could convince them that the people didn't know. And there were some certain situations where I felt like that could be really bad. Um, so I've started a line of research looking into like, what do users think about that? What is like a best way of like, Disclosure, or is there a combination thing, something called like human in the loop, where people know they're communicating with the UI and maybe there's also another human involved in addition to that. So it's kind of like that person's assistant is the AI that's helping them. Um, and lastly, I'm looking at data visualization for large scale data uh, to be used kind of for machine learning to basically adjust models. So these are some of the things I'm starting to explore. I still kind of feel like I'm new as a professor, so I'm kind of exploring multiple avenues. Uh, but I'd love to chat with some of you. Like, I would love to get more involved with the IP and T program. There was a question about like why maybe isn't there some more involvement, and hopefully there can be. I look forward to kind of chatting more with the professors here and getting to know them and kind of see what what we can uh, how we can. We tell us about uh, and then Professor Sud Weeks will give uh, blessing on the food and. But just tell us about the department. How many faculty are there? Where are you at? Uh, which college? So I'm, and, in the, I'm in the Department of Design and the Call of Fine Arts and Communications. Um, is UX a new, UX, yes. new area in? Yeah, UX is, is a new area. There was kind of like a, an emphasis within uh, an existing degree before uh, it was UX, uh, but now it'll be its own, its own separate degree with more credit hours. And right now there's technically one and a half uh, full-time faculty dedicated to the UX track or the UX degree. Um, hopefully we can grow that over the next years because that's not very many faculty. And 
Yes. Are you are you the one or the half? I'm the one. Okay. <laughs> it's like the half is a half like graphic design in the graphic design area of the department. So and we're very, very, very fortunate to have you, and we see UX very much interfacing with everything we do. I'm, I'm, I'm since I've come back, I've been surprised to find out how many you have an interest um, in UX. Just by the way, raise your hands if you have a personal interest in UX or have done some with it, and and um, very good. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>